Hello everyone and welcome to the second video about the security of quantum key distribution. In this video, we want to develop a mathematical description of the physical systems and processes that appear in a quantum key distribution protocol. If you remember the BB84 protocol from last time, this includes the stage where Alice prepares states, where she sends them over to Bob, and the stage where Bob measures the states. To describe the different steps in the quantum stage of a quantum key distribution protocol, or any experiment that involves quantum mechanics for that matter, we need to have mathematical descriptions of three different stages. The first one is the preparation stage. This is the stage where Alice prepares the states that she wants to send to Bob. The next one is the channel. That is the stage where Alice sends these states over to Bob. The last one is the measurement stage, where Bob measures the states he gets from Alice, and he usually gets a classical outcome X. The channel stage includes everything that happens between the preparation and the measurement. This includes every attack that Eve can perform. It also includes losses that occur in the channel and noise from the environment that happens. We'll include all these things into the channel description. Okay, so let's have a closer look at all these stages in detail. And the first thing that we need to do is we have to talk about the Hilbert space that we're working in. Okay, we usually denote the Hilbert space by a curly letter H. And we'll only briefly recap the most important features of a Hilbert space here and not go into too much detail. So a Hilbert space is a vector space over the complex number C. And we will use bracket notation to denote vectors in the Hilbert space. That is, if Z is a vector in the Hilbert space, we denote it with these brackets. And the Hilbert space has a scalar product that we can denote in two different ways. Usually, when we use the bracket notation, we usually use the letter notation of the scalar product. Furthermore, an orthonormal basis of a Hilbert space is a vector is a family of vectors xi that fulfills that the scalar product of a vector xi with itself is 1, and the scalar product of two different vectors within this orthonormal basis is 0. OK, that's everything we need to know about the Hilbert space for now. So let's go and have a look at the first stage of the quantum protocol. OK, the first stage is the preparation state, stage that we have seen in the first picture with this red box with a row in it. <clears throat> and the preparation is described by density operators. So a density operator rho is an element of the operators over the Hilbert space H. That is, we denote this with this curly B. And this is an operator that maps from the Hilbert space again into the Hilbert space. It has to fulfill some properties. Namely, it has to be normalized. So the trace of the density operator has to be 1. It has to be a Hermitian operator. So its Hermitian conjugate is equal to the density operator itself. And also, it has to be positive semi-definite. That is, if you calculate the product with a bra vector phi, rho, and a cat vector phi, this should be greater or equal to zero for every possible choice of phi. We often write this just as rho greater or equal to zero. <clears throat> we can also view a density operator as, a, as coming from an ensemble of pure states. So the density operator formalism is the most general formalism that includes pure states and mixed states. But we can also think about it as not knowing exactly in which pure state our system is. So we have an ensemble that specifies all the possible pure states that are here denoted as cat vectors psi i that are distributed with some probability distribution. So to every possible pure state, we assign a probability pi. And then the density operator rho is given by the sum over the probabilities pi and the operator psi i psi i, as you can see. 
In that picture, a pure state corresponds to the case where only one probability is equal to 1 and the others are equal to 0. So for example, the probability P3 is equal to 1 and all the rest are 0. Then the density operator is just the cat bra of Psi3 with Psi3. So the sum in equation 1 only has one term. And this is also how we can distinguish pure states and mixed states. If the sum in equation 1 only has one term, it is a pure state. If it has more, more than one term, it is a mixed state. OK, let's have an, a look at a very important example, which is qubits. We will need qubits all over quantum key distribution protocol, because this is how we encode information. So you have already seen an example of qubits in the last video when we discussed the polarization of photons. This is one way to encode a qubit into a physical system. But mathematically, you can just say the horizontally polarized, polarized state is the zero vector and the vertically polarized state is the one vector. <clears throat> and then a general qubit state would be a linear combination of the zero and the one vector with some probability amplitudes, alpha and beta, which are complex numbers that have to fulfill that the absolute value squared sum to one. So the alpha and beta are not the probabilities with which zero and one occur, but they are the amplitudes. And the probabilities are given by the absolute value squared. And that's why the sum of the absolute value squared has to equal 1. <clears throat> OK, so we can write out the basis vectors 0 and 1 as vectors. And we can, for example, choose the computational basis, where we have just 1, 0 as the 0 vector and 0, 1 as the 1 vector which then corresponds to the rectilinear basis that we had in the BB84 protocol. Of course, we can make a different choice of a, base, of a basis for the qubit state space. And a very common choice is the Hadamard basis that we denote with plus and minus vectors. And these, this is also um, an, an orthonormal basis for the qubit state space. And this would correspond to the diagonal polarization in the BB84 protocol. OK, that was everything that we need to know about the preparation state. So basically, it is described by density operators. And now we come to the next stage, the quantum channels. This is everything that happens after the preparation. So when Alice sends her prepared states to Bob, Everything that happens between her sending them and Bob receiving them happens in the quantum channel. But what is a quantum channel? So mathematically, a quantum channel is a linear, completely positive and trace preserving map. We usually denote this with a curly E. And it is a map that goes from the operators of the first Hilbert space, here denoted HA, to the operators over the second Hilbert space that we denote HB. OK, but what do all these adjectives mean? Let's have a look at each of these, each of these adjectives individually and start with linear. So a quantum channel is a linear map. That means that the following equation is fulfilled for every choice of density operators that we can make and all possible coefficients alpha and beta in the complex numbers. So if I have a linear combination of states, states, alpha times rho a plus beta times sigma a, and I apply this quantum channel to the, the, sta um, the state, then that should be the same as if I apply the quantum channel to the individual states and build a linear combination of that. That's what it means for a map to be linear. OK, that's the first thing that has to be fulfilled for a quantum channel. The second adjective is completely positive. Let's break it up. Let's start with positive. What does it mean for a map to be positive? 
Okay, so for the map E to be positive, that means that E applied to a state row A has to be positive semi-definite for all positive semi-definite row A in the set of operators over the Hilbert space HA. So for every choice of states row A that we can make, the map applied to the state has uh, to be has again to be a positive semi-definite operator. Well, that makes sense. But what does it mean to be completely positive? Okay, let's um, have a look at a picture that we have seen before, but in a slightly different way. Okay, so now this is the picture from the beginning, but I have added an additional state here. Okay, let's suppose we have a state rho in the beginning, and only at some part of rho we apply the channel E. The other part is just within a Hilbert space of some so-called innocent bystander. So nothing is happening here. The state is just evolving freely over to Bob without being um, attacked in any way. Okay, so now um, we still want that this kind of channel is well-defined. That means we still want that this um, the map that we get when we concatenate the identity on the H bystander with the map E, it should still be a positive map. So that's captured uh, within the definition of completely positive. It means that if I have the tensor product of the map E with the identity on the Hilbert space of the bystander, which we denote IDN here, <clears throat> then this map should be positive for all possible choices of N. So no matter how big we make this additional Hilbert space, this tensor product map should always be positive for all choices. <clears throat> okay, and the, the last condition that we have is trace preserving. So what we of course want is that the trace of the quantum state doesn't change. Mathematically, this means that the trace of the quantum state that we put into the channel is equal to the trace of the quantum state that we get when after we have applied the channel to the quantum state. And this should be true for all row A within the operators of HA. Okay, so all these uh, adjectives together, they ensure that a quantum, uh, a quantum state is always mapped to a quantum state by a quantum channel. So yeah, if you put in a quantum state, we can be sure we get a quantum state in the end. Now, there's a different way how we can write these quantum channels, and this is called the Krauss decomposition. Suppose we have a channel E, that is a, com a linear, completely positive, trace-preserving map, as we have defined before, then we can always find operators k, such that we can write the map as a sum over these operators applied to the state that we have put in. So these operators kj, they are maps from the Hilbert space ha to the Hilbert space hb. <clears throat> and we have d operators to dis oh, or we have at most d operators to describe this quantum channel where d is the product of the dimensions of the Hilbert spaces and the last condition that these k's have to fulfill is that if you sum all the kj dagger kj's together then you have to get the identity on the Hilbert space ha and um there's a theorem that says that if you have a com linear, completely positive trace-preserving map, then you can always find a Krauss decomposition for this map. And the other way around, if you have a map for that you have a Krauss decomposition, then this is a linear, completely positive trace-preserving map. So these descriptions are equal. <clears throat> okay, let's have a look at an example of a channel. A very simple example is the unitary evolution. This is the evolution of a closed system 
And as you can see, you only have one cause oper operator. So you have one unitary, we denote u, that you apply on your state to get um, the resulting state. And unitary evolutions, they are always reversible. It is very easy to find the inverse of the unitary evolution. You just take the dagger of the map. And then, as you can see, since u dagger u is equal to the identity, the concatenation of these maps is just the identity. Okay, but what about evolutions of open systems? One example is the so-called amplitude damping channel. Okay, you can uh, think of this channel as a channel that um, describes what happens when you have a two-level system, like an atom where you have a ground state and an excited state. Say the ground state is denoted by zero and the excited state is denoted by one. Then the amplitude damping channel tells you, or it, um, it models the decay uh, of the atom. So if the atom is in its excited state, then it will go to the ground state with the probability gamma, where gamma is, of course, between zero and one. And uh, the atom will stay in its excited state with the probability of one minus gamma. And if the atom is already in its ground state, then it will stay in the ground state with probability one. <clears throat> okay, what are the Krauss operators for this kind of channel? We have two Krauss operators. The first one, K1, is described as the square root of gamma times the cat rho and bra one. As you can see, if we apply k1 to the excited state, then you will get the ground state with a factor of gamma. So it exactly models what we wanted, that the excited state decays to the ground state with a probability gamma. But of course, um, this cannot be the only Krauss operator that describes the channel, because k1 dagger k1 is not the identity. So we need a second operator. And this is k2, which is described by the cat bra of 0 plus the square root of 1 minus gamma times the cat bra of 1. And you can easily verify that the sum of k1 dagger k1 plus k2 dagger k2 equals the identity. OK. So now we know about quantum channels. And of course, we can, in a specific protocol, you can also think of how you would model attacks that Eve can make in this quantum channel or losses within the quantum channel. There are lots of different quantum channels that you can model. So we can capture everything that happens between the preparation and the measurement in this quantum channel. Now, the final stage that we have is the measurement. The measurement stage is one where you receive a quantum state, you make a measurement, and you get a classical outcome x. So measurements are mathematically described by positive operator value measures. The definition of this is the following. So say we have a finite, and in this case, we also have a discrete outcome set curly x, then a POVM is a collection M of operators Mx that fulfill the following. So for every element in this outcome set X, which we denote by a small x, the operator Mx is a positive operator. And moreover, the sum over all the possible operators Mx is equal to the identity. We can calculate the probability of getting a specific outcome small x from the outcome set. And this is calculated by taking the trace over the state row in which our system is in times the operator mx. So in the picture to the right, we would actually have to write mx into the box if we want to have the outcome x. OK, and for a pure state, Psi, this simplifies to just uh, 
sandwiching the state Psi around the operator Mx, which you can easily see when you put in the corresponding density matrix into the trace formula. The last thing we might want to compute is the expectation value of our POVM over all the outcomes. And this is just done by taking the sum over all the outcomes in the outcome set of the outcome x times the trace of rho times mx. OK, so let's have a look at an example of a measurement. Say we want to measure qubits in the computational basis. OK, so we've seen qubits before. Say we have a qubit in the state rho, which is given by um, the density matrix uh, created with the pure state psi that is described as alpha times uh, the zero state plus beta times the one state. Okay, the POVM that describes the measurement in the computational basis is the following. The outcome set that we have is given by zero and one and the operators that we have denoted pi here are given by pi zero which is the cat bra with zeros, and the other operator is pi 1, which is the cat bra of 1s. And you can easily verify that the sum of these operators is actually 1, as we would need for a POVM. You can just uh, use the vector description that we had for the state 0 and 1, set up these matrices, and see that they equal the identity when you sum them. Okay, what about probabilities? As we have seen before, probabilities are computed in the following way. So say we have given the state row as described above and want to know the probability of the outcome zero. Then we have to take the trace over the state row times the POVM pi zero. And since we are actually having a pure state, we can just use the, the sandwich where we put the pure states outside of the uh, POVM element. OK, then you just write down all the states and you, you calculate, um, you, yeah, you do the calculation, which is actually quite easy in this case because the POVM elements are written down in the same basis as the qubit state. And then you can quickly see that the probability of getting a zero outcome is just the um, the absolute value of alpha squared. You can do the same calculation to get the probability of having a one outcome. Then you just use the POVM element pi one, and you can see that the probability of getting a one outcome is the absolute value of beta squared. And this is exactly what we would have expected since both the state and the measurement, they are in the same basis. Okay. But what happens if our measurement is in a different basis? Aside from the computational basis, we have also seen the Hadamard basis. OK, so let's see what happens if we measure a qubit state in the Hadamard basis. To make things interesting, we keep our qubit state the same as before, namely written down in terms of the computational basis. But now, of course, the POVM elements have changed. So the POVM is now given as follows. The outcome set is now plus or minus, and the operators are now pi plus and pi minus, and given in the same way as before, now just with the Hadamard basis instead of the computational basis. So pi plus is the cat bra with plus inside, and pi minus is the cat bra with minus inside. What do the probabilities now look like? So let's calculate the probability of getting a plus outcome when we have a qubit state given in the computational basis. OK, the scheme is the same as before. We have to take the trace over the operator row times the POVM element pi plus, And we can, again, use the formula for pure states. We do the computation, so we write down all the states. And now we see we have scalar products of 0 with plus and 1 with plus. And to make things easier, we can just use the 
formula of plus within the computational basis. So we rewrite our operators pi plus in terms of the computational basis. And you can see, as I've written it down here, that the cat plus is equal to 1 over square root of 2 times the cat plus plus the cat 1. Oh, sorry, the cat 0 plus the cat 1 in the computational basis. Okay, and if you now calculate all the scalar products within this uh, term, then you find out that the probability of getting a plus uh, outcome is the absolute value of alpha plus beta squared over 2. So this differs from the outcome that we had before. And so you can see the, the probabilities that you get actually they depend on the kind of measurement that you do. It, they depend on the basis that you choose for your measurement. Even though the plus minus basis is um, as, a, a go as good a basis as the 0, 1 basis, if you want to describe qubits, if you measure a qubit in a given basis, it makes a difference which basis you choose. You have already seen that in the previous video with the BB84 protocol, when you've seen that um, when Eve intercepted the, the protocol and she measured in the wrong basis, she, she just got a very random result. And this here is now the mathematical reasoning behind that. Okay, so now we've seen uh, examples of a measurement and we can go back to the picture on the first slide that I've shown you. So we've described all the different stages, the preparation stage, the channel stage, and the measurement stage. And we can now sum this up. And um, yeah, sum up that the preparation is described by density matrices. Channels are described by a completely positive and trace preserving and linear map. And the measurement is described by a positive operator valued measure. And this is everything that we need mathematically to, de to describe the different stages of the protocols that we want to look at. Okay, so today we have developed the mathematical description of quantum systems and quantum processes, which will be necessary to describe quantum key distribution protocols. And next time, we will discover more very important things for quantum key distribution protocols, especially to analyze the security of the protocols. One thing that we'll talk about next time is the no cloning theorem, which ensures that Eve cannot just copy the states that Alice sends perfectly, which would allow her to gain information without being detected. And the second very important thing that we have to talk about is entropies. So we'll define entropies, we'll learn lots of uh, theorems and properties of entropies. And they will appear everywhere in the, in the security analysis of quantum key distribution protocols. So thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.